We're not making an argument for this world as it is, minus borders. What would the world look like if we didn't need borders anymore? There are times when you're really speaking to people who believe in no borders and then you can really think about some kind of mechanics. And then there are other times when you're really just trying to persuade people that maybe deportation is terrible. Despite these, you know, anti-protest um, moves by the police and, and by the state, we've seen, you know, hundreds of people show up to resist immigration raids, lots of direct action around deportations. We've seen solidarity protests outside detention centres. We should be thinking about not just what change we're making in the here and now and what we're prefiguring right now, but also what are we making possible for people who come after us? Hi, welcome to the Verso podcast. My name is Ben Smoke. I'm the commissioning editor at Huck Magazine, and I was also one of the Stanford 15. I am delighted to have Grace Marie Bradley and Luke Denorona here together to talk about this. Um, thank you so much for making time to chat. I wanted to kind of start by talking a little bit about how this book came about. And um, obviously we've seen a huge increase in um, anti-immigration legislation over the past particular kind of couple of decades, but you know, stretching much further back. So why was it important to write this book right now? It was pertinent, particularly at the time we wrote it. You know, we'd, Brexit had just happened. Me and Gracie were on, finding ourselves on panels together talking about the Windrush scandal, about Stansted 15. Um, and about kind of charter flights in general. So we were finding ourselves in the same kinds of meetings or events or on the same panels, talking broadly about how we needed to make radical arguments uh, in defense of the rights of all migrants and all non-citizens. Um, I think at the time that we originally decided to write it, we were thinking about an audience perhaps partly within the Labour Party. Um, I remember when we first met with with our editor, um, there was an idea that maybe this would be pitched around the time of the world transforms, that maybe it would be about trying to bring uh, a kind of emergent and exciting left in the UK, but also that was often quite terrible on questions of immigration control and policing, um, that this would be a useful kind of intervention, a useful manifesto pamphlet to, to, to throw in there. Um, and we hope it still is, but obviously that moment changed, the pandemic happened. Um, so many of the contours of the things that we were thinking through politically changed. But broadly, what we wanted to do was write a book um, that made the case for a world without borders. And I think in the process of having our first conversations, we realized um, that the concept of abolition was one that we were finding exciting from the other things we were reading and from the mood in the air. That lots of people were thinking about abolition and practicing abolition. And so the challenge, I suppose, for us was to transpose the literature, the politics, and the practices around prison and police abolition, and question how it would work for immigration controls, borders, and citizenship. We've done a few of these podcasts now, and we did one um, around the abolition of family. We went earlier in the year, we were talking um, with um, Matt Foote and Mark Livingston about um, police, and we kind of got onto that. And each time I find myself kind of having, uh, wrestling with the same question, which is like, what comes next? Because you know, abolition, I think, is a really useful political tool. It's got, you know, a wealth of incredible literature behind it. But often when people hear it, they just think, okay, that's it, it's the end, no more cops. And then people are like, well, what, what does that world look like? So the immediate kind of, I guess when you say abolish borders, people are just like, hmm, well? But from your perspective, what does the beginnings of that look like? As we were really keen to emphasise in the book, we don't think that there's one hegemonic view of the world in which we will all flourish at some amorphous point in the future. We're not kind of trying to set out programmatically, you know, A to B, this is how we get there. Um, I suppose for us, thinking about, thinking with abolition was useful because as Ruthie Gilmore tells us, you know, abolition is about presence as well as absence. So it's not just the absence of borders. And that's why we're quite keen in the book to distinguish ourselves from the kind of libertarian right who argue for open borders because borders get away, get in the way of the movement of labor and, you know, the full realization of capitalism unchained, et cetera, et cetera. So that we're not making an argument for this world as it is, minus borders. Um, that's not what we're trying to say. And I think, you know, we draw on that really rich abolitionist literature 
we draw on Angela Davis's question around, you know, how do we make prisons obsolete? We're really thinking about how do we make borders obsolete? How do we change the social conditions to which borders are a response? What would the world look like if we didn't need borders anymore, recognizing that they already don't solve the problems that people say they solve? So that's really our point of departure. And so you'll see that when we start thinking about non-reformist reforms or changes in the here and now, we're thinking, right, you know, we're thinking at a kind of city, community level, you know, we're talking about sanctuary cities, universal access to public services, and so on, um, you know, people able to move and work without their rights being limited. But we're also thinking really expansively about relations between nation states and relations between political communities. You know, we're thinking about in the medium term, what if more countries had, for example, free movement agreements with one another, bilateral free movement agreements? Uh, what if we picked up Ashil and Bembe's invitation to make Africa a space of free movement? Um, what if actually global development was not about kind of fixing and immiserating people in the poor situations that they're already in right now? What if actually we were I don't know, sharing technologies that made people more able to adapt to climate catastrophe. Um, so that's for us, when we look at those non-reformist reforms, that's where some of those seeds are right now. But I think the big question and what we're really pointing to is the fact that there have got to be ways of relating to one another that don't mean we each have to be in a nation and have relations that are mediated government to government. There have got to be other ways for us to relate to people near us and far away from us that don't involve a violent, punitive state. And we see those relations, you know, every, every time there's some kind of direct action, solidarity action, every time that somebody does something, I don't know, sets up a, a free kitchen, a, a pantry in their neighbourhood, um, reclaims some fallow land and decides to grow things on it, um, we see those seeds all the time. I think it's harder to think of at the big international level, um, but that's the challenge that we want to lay down to one another. And I think for me, that question was really raised by... Angela Davis speaking a few years ago at the South Bank Centre when she said, why do we assume that the nation state is the default container for human community? And that's really what we're inviting people to think about. I think that's really interesting. And I think that lots of what you've covered there almost, um, <laughs> like it fills me with hope, but it also fills me with dread in the sense of like, these things, I can't remember who the quote is and I'm definitely gonna bastardize the quote, but, um, is you know, th there's only one thing we need to change and that's everything. And what I really love about this is the way that you kind of take borders and kind of segment them and look at how they interact, you know, kind of with race and with gender, with family, with capitalism. Um, and it just becomes evident how entrenched they've become. I wonder if we could kind of take a moment, particularly for people that maybe aren't, over I mean, immigration law, has, I think I read a stat, and this is 100% out of date now, because I think it was a few years ago, but I read a stat that was like, in 1971, there was 41 pages of immigration legislation, and now there's 3,000. And it's almost certainly more than that, because I think that was like four years ago. And so even people that work within immigration law you know, can't get their heads around. The Home Office spend most of the time working off of the wrong bits of law. So just to kind of give a real crash course in how borders have permeated our individual lives because I think that's actually quite an important place to start with abolition and looking at how we can interact with it on a you know not on the global scale which is like very daunting and terrifying um so yeah if you could just sort of like run through that real quick yeah I mean maybe one thing to say is that people have heard of the hostile environment most people in the British context um which became a kind of objective criticism around and scandal around the Windrush scandal. Um, the hostile environment was really about trying to internalize the border, make borders every day by enlisting all public services to have to, you know, perform certain forms of checking, status checking, and to share information with the Home Office. So that's a good example, I think, of how all that does is extend a set of processes which were already happening and are happening all around nation states all around the world. But that is that borders are becoming um, not only kind of hardened at the edges, not only the camps and the walls and the detention centers and the deportation flights, all of which are happening as well in, in parallel, but a kind of intensification of internalized boring where, bo where borders become more dense, more kind of multiplied, more heterogeneous, more, more kind of, you know, so 
where before in countries like, especially in countries like Canada, the US and Australia, which are the first countries of modern immigration control, you, would, you could kind of safely assume that if you, got, if you were an immigrant and you were able to stay, that you'd be on some kind of linear path towards citizenship because those were countries of immigration. I think now all immigration regimes increasingly make people temporary. Um, it's very hard to switch statuses. Uh, the constraints on you which police that you are a student only working 20 hours or you are a spouse who's not working, not there to work, and if you leave your relationship you can be deported, that you are um, a particular worker for a particular employer, etc. That that's where the intensification has happened, which means then that what immigration controls do when they're intensified and all of those pages of legislation is they get into all of our lives. Um, they become part of, a kind of the wider remit and reach of certain state institutions. Uh, as you know, it means that there are immigration vans roaming around the streets um, with police-like powers to try and raid places of work or people's homes. Um, it means that there are forms of data sharing where, you know, your kid has to give the... Well, no, not fortunately because ABC um, won, but that kids were... The hostile environment was about ensuring that, you know, children had to give their nationality. People in court, prisoners do. Um, people in universities, people in, hosp in hospitals and... And NHS services. So I think that intensification is part of what those reams of legislation are about, although also lots of that could be, you know, those pages could be reduced. Um, the immigration system's a mess, and, uh, you know, there, there could be arguments for making it more hostile and having fewer pages, right? So, and in some ways, that's what te the technological fixes offer. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if we can straight away equate those kinds of reams of legislation. They're actually part of they might be part of where we have an opportunity because the system's such a mess and not particularly efficient in, in some ways. Um, but yeah, I think that intensification of borders, the density of borders, the way they follow us around is also a political invitation to realize that it's about all of us. It's about new forms of surveillance, new forms of disentitlement, new forms of conditionality. That should mean we're all aware, actually, not only because we care about a group called immigrants over there, but because we care about the kind of place we live and the kind of state we live under, um, about getting rid of all these forms of very invasive uh, control and can I I think um, the other thing to say about the hostile environment and the way that immigration controls have permeated every level of society is that of course this is warping people's professional obligations you are the teacher collecting asking kids to fill in the school census you are the hospital worker that is asking somebody their nationality um, I'm not going to go. You're the police officer, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're the you're the you're the university lecturer who's having to tell your students you need to be fingerprinted, you need to scan in. I have to hand this list to a certain office in the university, and they have to share this information with the Home Office. So it's also disciplining public servants into surveilling um, people that they're you know ostensibly there to treat or teach, nurture educationally, and of course that runs really strongly in tandem with the securitization of our public services more broadly, um, because that system of checking runs alongside, you know, kind of gangs policing surveillance, gangs matrix and so on. It runs alongside lots of counter-terror policing and initiatives like Prevent. So you're kind of seeing all of these different suspect groups, A, being surveilled and policed in these different ways by public services, but you're also seeing that policing becoming an integral part of public services that ostensibly are not supposed to be about that at all. And that's a state that governs all of us. Those are public services that we all access. And so, yeah, it might be terrorists and immigrants and so on right now, but it's also benefits claimants. So you've seen the same kind of data sharing that was done between public services and the Home Office to migrants. That's happened now with disabled protesters having the DWP notified by the police. Oh, well, this person was at a protest. Are you sure that they actually can't do X, Y, Z? Do they actually need that benefits entitlement? So it's a kind of policing that, you know, whoever becomes suspect, that category is not fixed. That's going to affect all of us at some point. I guess it's, you know, kind of what I mean when I talk about like rooms of legislation is that like, the way that it's made border officials of so many of us, so many of members of society that are, as you say, kind of public servants supposed to be there to be performing a role that is you know, good to a certain extent, depending on who it is and how well they're doing their job. Um, and I think that's really what I got from this and what I think is so important about it is understanding that the struggle against borders and the struggle 
to abolish borders is not simply limited to the emancipation and the liberation of people that are seen as other, of a migrant class. It does affect every single person, even down to, you know, even in the last sort of few years, you now, the way in which we rent, right, has changed. You, know, you have to jump through certain hoops, which makes it very difficult if you're on a low income and you don't have identification to then be able to rent a house because of immigration legislation. And the way that it's sort of like become this behemoth, I think, is really important to recognise that. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit, it kind of in the aftermath of Windrush, and you, there's kind of, is it the first chapter? I think it's the first chapter um, about race and the way that, you know, how this is, you kind of mentioned it a little bit about the gangs matrix and, and stuff like that, can you kind of expanding on the way in which immigration legislation in this country has been used as a kind of ramroad to, to almost kind of codify lots of the, the racism that exists very violently within the country. Yeah, I mean, on the question of criminalisation, I think it's worth picking up that both me and Gracie had spent time in our previous work and continue to thinking about the problem of people who are criminalised and in the immigration system. And like you say, after the wind rush, um, the UK government was able to send charter flights to Jamaica, a place that I've um, connected to think about a lot in, in relation to these questions, um, precisely by arguing that everyone on the flight was a serious foreign criminal. And so every press release from the Home Office was that this flight has nothing to do with the wind rush migrants. Everyone on it is a serious foreign criminal. So if we think about the issues we said we started with, Brexit, um, charter flights, mass deportation flights, um, Windrush scandal, you can see all of the arguments, I think, and where our intervention is in, those, in the ways in which people got it so wrong. Um, I, I quote in, in somewhere, I've quoted David Lammy, who has an opinion piece in The Guardian around the Windrush scandal, in which he says, he uses the word citizen something like 17 times in a short 800 word article. Um, and, and what he's saying in every sentence is illegal, Im the, the, you know, um, the Windrush migrants are citizens, not illegal immigrants. And he keeps saying it over and over again, um, which works quite well for the Home Office when they then say, these people are illegal immigrants, serious foreign criminals, no less, not citizens like the Windrush migrants. We agree that was wrong. So while the Windrush scandal was the only time I saw the Home Office on the pages of the right wing press uh, being, you know, criticized for being too harsh, or too blunt, or rather just deporting the wrong ones, basically. Um, we were trying to change, you know, to, to explode all of that, obviously with, with a bunch of other people who've made the same arguments, radicals, no borders activists, other people in the, in the world and places where we live who've taught us a lot. But we were really trying to work through that question around how it becomes so easy for the Home Office and for other governments to say, these are serious foreign criminals, not, um, not deserving citizens, and I think Barack Obama has that thing where he says, mums um, picking up their kids from school, not felons or something like that. He's got this felons, whole, not this, families or something yeah, like that. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, so I suppose that question about deservingness was something we had both been concerned about. We'd both focused on the people who are on the hard end of things like counter-terror policy, of things like policing and prisons, of things like indefinite detention and deportation. Um, that has become increasingly salient and important. And I think what the book in a way you can think through what it does in the in, in the race chapter in particular is think about how uh, in policing and prisons chapter in thinking about counter-terror in thinking about race and capitalism thinking about how racism other forms of undeservingness through not being productive um, not being a proper gendered um, not being a proper acting as a proper woman a spouse often or as a responsible father etc that these questions kind of run through the whole book and they're really about how well if we don't make arguments against innocence, uh, or we don't make arguments for those people who might uh, be, w be claiming welfare benefits, might be using drugs, might be selling sex, might be cr have criminal records, might, um, might even have done things that we find, you know, um, objectionable. If we don't have arguments for those groups, then we're just going to wait until the goalposts are shift and there's another deportation flight. Uh, there might be no one to stop it this time, I'm afraid. Um, and then, then we'll be in, in the same situation again and we won't really have progressed. And I think that's really, you know, that's, a, that's really why we wrote the book and runs through all the chapters. When we were kind of coming to do the Stansted trial and lots of the media around it, 
we often ended up talking about this woman who rang the detained voices um, hotline like the day or two before the the flight was due to go. And she was um, a Nigerian lesbian. She'd um, been in a marriage in Nigeria. If I remember correctly, it was like an arranged or forced marriage. She'd had children. She'd left, come here to live as a lesbian, was like vibing, you know, full L word, just the truth. And then she got detained uh, and she was kind of sending money back to support her kids who were being looked after by her sister. Um, she got detained and she was going to be deported and her, like two days before, her abusive ex-husband rang her and was like, you know, we know you're coming, I know you're coming, we're going to be waiting here and we're going to kill you. Mm-hmm. And we, which obviously, you know, like I, even now I remember, I vividly remember the, the last words she said on that call were, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, please help me. Who's going to look after my children if I'm dead? I'm begging you. And it's just like, I still get chills thinking about it because we read it on the way to the airport when we were doing it to like really center ourselves in what, and it was you know, one of the things that I ended up talking a lot about in the media. And there is a utility in it. Like, you know, obviously her, she did not deserve to be, nobody deserves to be deported, but like her particular circumstances were so extreme that she was facing death, she was facing torture. But in entering into that, you unconsciously enter into what you're talking about, you know, the sort of deserving and undeserving. And what I'm really interested to, to find out, and I don't think there's a perfect answer to this, is how do we recognize that we have to, we have to kind of like pull people along and sometimes the way that we pull people along actually ends up undermining mm-hmm. our argument. I think we have to acknowledge what it's like actually doing the work in the moment of doing the work. It's all very well and good to sit and reflect on the Verso podcast or, you know, sit and write your book together. But it is only through doing the work, really, that we learn to navigate these things. And sometimes we, we don't do it as well as we might like and then we do it better next time and we've learned something for the time after that or we can share it with some people doing something similar. So I think we... I just... I would want to emphasise that, like, yeah, we just have to do the work and learn as we do the work. We can't just think about it too much and then hope that it comes out perfect on the day. Um, And, you know, I was at the time, I think I was at Liberty when you did that action. And a lot of the time, actually, at Liberty, we would have to be in the press defending direct action maybe not saying whether or not we supported the underlying cause, but also trying to find ways to talk about it that left a lot of doors open. And I think it is about finding the openings. I don't think that there ever is necessarily a perfect line. Like I remember in the moment at that time, I think it had been after a little while of you guys doing press, different people doing press, and I could see certain lines being really strong and certain lines kind of not being there at all. And I remember saying, like, everybody on that flight mattered. Like, nobody on that flight should have been deported. But at the same time, when you have the whole weight of the Conservative, you know, I know what it's like to sit in those rooms with these people who are politically so different to you and to feel like what you think is illegitimate and feel the weight of them just trying to squash that out of you so that you say the acceptable thing. And so even actually saying, you know, well, that woman shouldn't have been deported in that moment, in that space, is a radical thing to say. And like, you know, we're human. And so I don't, I don't want to be really black and white about it. But I think it's about finding the opening and figuring out how to prize it wider, Mm. right? So that even if that's the story that gets somebody's attention, what else do you then talk to them about? What follows it? You know, is it you tweeting about like, you know, please donate to our group? Or is it you, you know, is it you saying something about like, I don't know, legislation that's coming up? Or is it actually you saying something about another story that people wouldn't have picked up, but actually they've started thinking and now they might think some more, right? So I think that's part of it. Is once you've got people's attention, what do you do with it? What are the ends to which, to which you, yeah, you put your resources? One of the things I've always thought is important is as someone like you who wants to write or as other people who want to create films or podcasts or whatever, part of doing that well is being able to bring out stories that aren't only that we could do, you could do a, you know, a story of that woman and she could write her own story. Um, and that would be really compelling, but it could also be the person on there who seems the least deserving. And that might be worth seeing what happens, I suppose, when you try um, collectively together, individuals themselves to give space to say things that don't fit into any narrative. Because I think if we become um, 
kind of too media trained as though what we really need to do is win this little argument and get this little change from this little like become lobbyists then what what are we doing um we do have to do that is part of it but we also have to you know tell other kinds of stories have all sorts of creative utopian crazy manifesto like publications and things that we say to one another um ways that we can at the after yeah yeah (laughs) exactly whenever but i mean that i guess that's the other important thing is to think that there are different moments to intervene, different people you speak to. And, and with this book, I guess, we're imagining that we're trying to speak to several people at once, several kinds of people at once. And when I'm, you know, in events and stuff, there are times when you're really speaking to people who you know or know, who believe in no borders, and then you can really think about some some kind of mechanics. And then there are other times when you're really just trying to persuade people that baby deportation is terrible. This is what it looks like. People get taken in the middle of the night. We have to say all these things, right? People are separated from families. We have to rely on the family. We say these things. But I would still say them, even though mm. I would want an immigration, I would want no immigration system, but I would want people not to have to gain rights through the family. I would still say that this person is a mother of two children. Yeah. Isn't, that ter- isn't that terrible? And it is. And it actually, it makes me think of, so I attended um, an abolition feminisms workshop a few weeks ago and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Craig Gilmore both spoke right at the end. And I was, you know, they spoke a lot about campaign to stop a prison being built in California and bringing loads of different people and groups into that campaign and, you know, using whatever language or arguments that were at hand or that those groups would use in order to stop that prison from being built, whether it was the environmentalists saying, you know, it's going to do such and such to the natural habitat and so on. Mm. Um, It wasn't necessarily all straight up abolitionists. We don't think anyone should be in prison anywhere. And I asked afterwards, you know, what do you do if you kind of are going into coalition with all of these different groups that don't necessarily share your ultimate end goal or you know if you're making arguments in language that you wouldn't necessarily use you know behind closed doors but that you know will get something over the line in the moment how do you navigate all of that and Ruthie kind of was talking about the fact that you you know you make the arguments that you have to make in that moment to win that particular thing to stop that prison from being built but what she then talks about was the fact that they then built an abolition geography that meant no more prisons in California could be built. And that work took decades. And I think that that is what we have to think about. It's not necessarily just about that one spectacular moment. And it's not, as Luke said, about whether or not you get that right line in that one interview in that moment. It's what happens afterwards. Like, what? how does this ricochet along for years, for decades? What does it make possible? You know, as someone who'd been in... NGO policy spaces, working on hostile environment immigration stuff, for a long time I had been trying to get more senior people to, you know, take a line on charter flights, for example, take a line on no recourse to public funds, and, you know, they're classic, you know, I was the only black person in the policy team, and they were just sort of like, what you want about, you know, why, why, what, no, too radical, no. So I was dismissed quite a lot. After you did your action, what do we have? So many reformist NGOs stop the flights. And you know what? I'm not going to be snarky about it Mm. because actually that is just what everybody needed to be saying. And that is what people needed to be working towards. Like that is the shift that needed to happen. And that action prized open that space and you made space for lots of people in lots of different institutional contexts to do work that they'd been trying to do to be heard in ways that we hadn't been heard. Um, And so ultimately, like, yeah, your lines might not have been exactly what you wanted them to be, but look what became possible. I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's sort of understanding the butterfly effect almost when you're in it you spend a lot of time thinking about oh yeah we kind of fucked that or i would do that differently butterfly effect is great and amazing and inspiring you know and to and to to kind of think about your actions in a way that it can can create these things but how do we do that in a way that's slightly more intentional we have a lot to learn like it's not as if activism is new uh, or just working to change the world is new um And it's work that's been done not just by people that we agree with, but that's also done very effectively by people that we disagree with and there are tactics that we we might want to have a look at. Um, So there's a lot that we can study and read and learn about social change. Um, So I think that that's part of it. Um, But I think if we just understand ourselves as part of a wider ecosystem, that, I think, takes a lot of the pressure off. And I know that you've talked about abolition feeling kind of daunting or overwhelming. But actually, for me, when I think about, like, I am one person acting and working with lots of other people, 
sometimes we're doing that strategically and together and sometimes we're just doing things at the same time in the same moment and we don't know how they're going to interact with one another I feel like that takes a lot of the pressure off me and if I also recognize that I'm doing work that might you know it might have an effect not in my lifetime in somebody else's lifetime um, if we get out of the kind of temporality of the election cycle or the sound by um, or the you know the day's news that also takes a lot of the pressure off because we should be thinking about not just what change we're making in the here and now and what we're prefiguring right now but also what are we making possible for people who come after us um, what might we inspire um, in people who see what we're up to right now um, so I think for me kind of you know black feminism has done a lot for me and kind of helped me move away from the very masculinist, patriarchal, heroic narrative of it's one person that, you know, stands up to a cop or, you know, like you do it together. You guys did that action together and you were supported by an even wider movement. Like none of us is doing anything on our own. Um, so I think it's about understanding where we are in the ecosystem and recognizing that, look, there are people who are firefighting sometimes and just stopping the terrible thing from happening. And I think that's what a lot of NGOs are doing. That's sometimes what's happening when there are big waves of protest against specific pieces of legislation. Um, that's what lawyers are doing when they're doing one-to-one -one casework, getting somebody off a flight, challenging no recourse to public funds conditions. So sometimes you're just trying to hold the status quo. But the reason we have to look at our whole movement is that we can't all just be trying to do the firefighting. And I think for me, that was part of why we wanted to do this book with its big, imaginative, ambitious vision, because somebody has also got to be stepping back a bit and thinking, what does the world we want to live in look like? What's our long range goal? How do we think we're going to get there? How does that firefighting fit in with that world we want to get to? Because we know the status quo doesn't work. It's not actually where we want to be. And I feel like the political moment, not moment, but I feel like the political mood of the last few years has had the effect of really pushing people up into firefighting and people not being able to rest and look back and think, there's utopia, that's where I want to be. Thanks so much for your time. It was a great conversation. I think so much of it, um, when we talk about like things being daunting, um, it's when I'm like sat at home at like 2 a.m. And when I'm out and when I'm organizing and speaking to people, um, as you were saying, like, with the ecosystem, it sort of fades away. And so now, in a beautiful segue, we're going to speak to Zara Hassan from Joint Council for Welfare of Immigrants, talk more about direct action, talk more about like physically taking lots of the ideas in this book into the real world. So I'm the advocacy director at the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, um, which is an organisation that was set up over 55 years ago by um, the community, um, anti-racist community and migrant communities in Southall, basically to fight against fascism at the time and like really right wing government policy uh, around migration. And 55 years later, we're still here doing the same thing. Um, and essentially, we kind of, you know, do public campaigning, um, parliamentary work um, and also legal work. So we represent individuals uh, in their immigration cases as well, basically to fight against the really hostile um, policies of this government and governments before it and governments to come. Um, and also to try and kind of build the movement of people who will join us in that fight. And so um, we've just kind of spoken to Gracie and Luke about the way in which borders have developed over the last, I mean, particularly a couple of decades mm -hmm. and their vast expansion into our private lives and globally. And I wondered whether you can talk a little bit about how you guys are, are fighting that kind of beyond just the the, I was going to say simple legal cases. None of them are simple, but yes. kind of it, the reaching out, the you know, the the trying to join the dots together, which I think is you know, such a an important part of it, and a theme that keeps coming up in lots of these conversations. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I think you know, as you kind of say, what we've seen over recent years is like increased bordering in like every aspect aspect of our lives so whether that's kind of you know borders to be able to access basic services like healthcare um and schools um or whether that's like you know kind of physical borders and people being forced to cross the channel because this government doesn't want to open safe routes for them um so we we basically try and support everyone and every person who's moved to the UK, um, however they've moved to the UK um, and whatever kind of situation they're in. 
but at the moment I think our kind of key focus really is on um, you know advancing the rights of migrant workers um, and particularly undocumented migrant workers also trying to address the issue of undocumentation more generally and how it's actually immigration policy and like very expensive visa fees that push people out of status and leads to them becoming undocumented and then being subject to criminalization by this government. Um, and also looking at the relationship between um, climate justice and migrant justice um, and how climate change obviously disproportionately is affecting people in the global south and why people therefore then move to the UK and the UK's history of like colonialism, which has obviously played a big role in that as well. Um, so those are kind of our key focus areas, but we obviously have been doing a lot of work to respond to the kind of moves that this government has been making as well, like the Rwanda plan and like the kind of increased criminalization of people forced across the channel. Um, so that's kind of been our focus. And, you know, for years we've been fighting to end the hostile environment and that battle continues as well, because that really does underpin pretty much everything we do. Um, so we organized a carnival of resistance this summer to mark 10 years of the hostile environment and the kind of fight towards, you know, ending it in the future. So, um, yeah, we kind of work across all areas and importantly support the rights of all migrants, you know, whoever they are, however they came to the UK and whatever they need. And obviously, like at the moment, we are in... We're in autumn now. Where are, where yes, are we? Autumn, autumn. <laughs> but yeah. We had. It we, doesn't feel like it. It but doesn't. We are, yeah. It's like nine hundred degrees mm. in here and out there. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. We had hot strike summer. Yeah. We've got a hot strike autumn. Yeah. We're gonna have a hot strike winter. Perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my favorite. Um, and obviously, you know, that's incredible and, and great. But I think it would be fair to say that there have been some issues in mm -hmm. terms of a wider trade union movement mm -hmm. and the way in which they have interacted with a lot of the struggles that yeah. you know, JCWI and many others are involved in. Can you talk a little bit about what JCWI are doing to try and interject um, you know, migrant rights and the rights of migrant workers and, and wider yeah. struggles within that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, like you say, like historically, you know, I think a really prime example of it is the Grunwick strikes, you know, which was a strike led by migrant women um, that was undermined by parts of the trade union movement. And I think that history is really important for us to contend with. Um, but I think there's so much scope now for trade unions to get it right and to be able to support migrant workers. So we work very closely with the kind of grassroots migrant led trade unions. We work very closely with um, amazing unions like IWGB um, to kind of advance the key demands we have on migrant workers rights. And those are things like abolishing the illegal working offence so everyone has the right to work, abolishing um, right to work checks um, by employers, um, making sure that people can um, come to the UK and access safe work as well, because at the moment there's a real focus on kind of temporary visa schemes, which we know can push people into exploitation. Liz Truss was all about that. And, um, you know, we've been saying, you know, it's not this kind of either or of either, you know, this government saying like no immigration or no increased immigration or increased immigration, but treat migrants as cheap labor. Um, we're kind of saying actually what we need are rights for all workers. And if we have rights for migrant workers, that will improve the situation for all workers in this country. And so that's something we're working really closely with a lot of trade unions, big and small, to kind of make those demands um, and trying to ensure that the trade union movement speaks with a kind of unified voice on these issues. And I think we seen some unions you know really identify this the rmt have made some um you know important comments about how people and and their members are affected by these issues as well so i think we can kind of bring them um all on board and make those demands and so for people in the union movement because i think one thing <coughs> that i really wanted to get out of this section oh. is for those listening and watching to be able to kind of like have some practical things they can go away yeah. with so people that are involved in the union movement like what's the best way yeah you know, particularly if they are in some of the more mainstream un unions yeah. that potentially aren't quite on board <laughs> yet what's the best way for them to start agitating within their union yeah i mean i think the first thing is to organize with migrant workers and to do that in solidarity with them um and to ensure that it's their demands and it's their concerns that are central to any discussion I think the other thing that we really want to kind of focus on um, in the immediate future is this demand for firewalls between um, immigration enforcement and labor inspectors because that puts migrant workers at risk because it means that um, you know there are joint uh, kind of 
inspections between labor inspectors and immigration enforcement. So that's obviously really terrible and we want to end that. But also it means that people don't feel comfortable to report labor rights violations because of that data sharing. And it would be really great to see trade unions trying to help us organize around that, um, because I think there's a really important voice there around workers' rights and workers' safety um, and being able to have kind of fair conditions um, and advocate for those fair conditions. So I think, you know, if that's something that trade unions could start to, to organize around and support. As a, as a concrete demand, I think that would be really brilliant. And in terms of people maybe not involved with the trade union movement or looking to organise outside of it, I think one thing, one, you know, one sort of surge that we've seen over the last few years is direct action. Yeah. Um, you know, one or two, <laughs> yeah, I'm aware maybe. of. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I kind of, you know, I think at the moment there's a case... Um, the, the Brookhouse case, mm. um, and it was three, is it three? Yep, smashing this. <laughs> she read it on the way here, and I don't know why all information has dropped out of my head. Um, three people locked themselves together um, to stop a coach mm-hmm. coming out of Brookhouse Detention Centre just outside of Gatwick. They've now been charged with public nuisance. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is something that we've obviously seen um, yeah, replicated. Uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, the link between climate justice and migrant justice. I also think it's really important to look at the link between the way in which the climate movement, the climate Absolutely. protesters, are being, uh, you know, that often are a testing ground for mm. the way that policing and charging and mm-hmm. the criminal justice system will then go out. You know, we saw Absolutely. the Frack Free Three charged with public nuisance, mm-hmm. and now Brook House Three. Yeah. <laughs> Cute. Exactly. Um, so I just kind of wanted, from your perspective, I've spoken loads. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why it's so important mm. that these actions happen. Um, I know that you've organised across various different struggles and mm. you know, from the grassroots up. So maybe a little bit about your experience of that yeah. um, and how you got into it. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I think the first thing to say is that, like, I think one thing that our movement has to do more of and that I think it is doing, but definitely there's like more room for it is to connect all these struggles whether it's policing climate degradation borders prisons um and i think that's why you know these movements are really important to kind of bring together those issues i think also that's in response to the way that the government is acting um you know we've seen for example a kind of raft of you know really draconian authoritarian legislation including the policing act and the borders act and what those things do kind of in conjunction with each other is criminalize um you know migrant communities but also criminalize people standing in solidarity with them um and when we're facing such a kind of hostile government we've got you know massive tory majority there on the far right we have a Labour government that, you know, where Keir Starmer literally said last week that there's not much difference between their immigration policy and the Tories' immigration policy. The only way to materially challenge these things right now in the immediate term is through collective action, Um, whether that's through trade union organising or through direct action. I think that's why it's so important. And, you know, there's also the obvious point, which is that, you know, it's people's lives at risk. And if there's a way that we can stop people from being detained, being deported, being ripped from their communities, their families, their homes, then we should be able to do that. And we've seen a growing movement of people doing that despite these, you know, anti-protest um, moves by the police and, and by the state. We've seen, you know, hundreds of people show up to resist immigration raids. We've seen like lots of direct action around deportations. We've seen solidarity protests outside detention centers. And I think, you know, the link with with climate justice is really important. And I think there's a lot to learn kind of within both struggles. Um, And there's a really brilliant um, kind of grassroots collective that's recently set up called No Borders in Climate Justice. And the work they're trying to do is to kind of bring some of the messaging around, um, you know, the violence of borders and uh, climate and migration to the climate movement as a kind of political education project so that, you know, climate activists understand better how their struggle connects with the struggle for migrants' rights. Um, And because we know some climate groups haven't got that right in the past and have said things that, you know, haven't been... Oh, um, boy. (laughs) Yeah, we could have a whole other podcast about that. Uh, that I will never fucking stop. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, But I think that's important because, you know, there are people who are 
making those connections. I think Just Stop Oil have, you know, connected some of their actions to the prison industrial complex. So we are seeing those conversations and those links um, kind of starting to formulate more um, within some areas of the climate um, space. So I think, you know, there's so much that we can do together. And if we keep building the movement like we have and making it a more cohesive movement, I think it would be really powerful, um, especially given what we're facing. I think one thing for me is that you know, kind of watching stuff uh, like what happened in Pollock Shields in Glasgow, mm. what happened in Peckham, um, what happened in Edinburgh, Dalston, other places, mm. I'm sure, yeah. is, um, you know, it takes a certain amount. I think I've spoken about this quite a lot. It takes a certain amount of privilege to be able to, mm. for example, like break into an airport. 100%. Um, <laughs> and spend like, you know, taking everything else aside, mm. just having the time to be able to like yeah. put your life on hold and yeah. spend all that time on trial and all this stuff. You know, having the connections and the skills and mm. then, you know, it's a very limited pool of people that actually have the ability um, and the privilege to be able to do that. I often worried about how we could build yeah. when it was just that, when it was sort of just us, you know, going in, breaking into an airport or mm. just us locking ourselves to stuff. But that community mm. kind of, spirit yeah. to me is really inspiring because not only does it not only does it sort of like debunk the how common think around migration in this country mm. if you read any of the mainstream media outlets mm. um you'd think that everybody was there like yeah, ready and waiting yeah um but the reality is it's not it's just simply no. not true and like seeing people on mm. the street is so inspiring and i wonder whether we could talk a little bit about like what what you do in that situation. Yeah. So you're walking down the street, you just got your little oat latte, yeah. you're know, listening to your tunes, you've got the new tailor on, um, and you see an immigration van. Mm. In that moment, what what's what are the what are the steps? Yeah. I mean, I think the really important thing, and you know, anti-raids networks do amazing training on this, so there's way more to say on this than I'll be able to kind of summarize briefly, but um I think the key thing is to not walk by. Um, it's to stop. It's to centre the person who's being kind of questioned or, or harassed by the state, to ask them if they're OK, what they need, um, to remind them of what rights they have, whether that's, you know, the fact that they don't need to answer questions and they can walk away, um, whether that's trying to find them support if it is kind of, you know, legal advice or, or whatever it is. Um, and key key thing is to also encourage people around you to also stop to make it safer for yourself um, and to kind of build a, a kind of physical presence on the ground where you know the the cops or the border guards who are there feel that they are being watched um, and that they can't just get away with enacting violence against this individual or this group of people um, without other members of the public kind of showing up and I think there's a really kind of strong tradition of this, you know, um, in movements in this country, you know, I think in particular, when we look at groups like Sisters Ankar or Soas Detaini support, um, all groups like Stop Deportations, um, the Cop Watch Network, these are all groups that have been kind of formed and led predominantly by queer working class women of colour. Um, and, you know, they've been doing this work for, for years and years. And there's so much to be learned from those spaces. And that's why I kind of remain really involved in that work, because I think it's so vital and only through kind of connecting with people in our local communities, connecting with those sorts of more radical forms of activism, can we actually like bring other people along with us? Um, but that can start by someone showing up to a meeting or by someone stopping on the street, because as soon as someone sees it and they see the violence kind of firsthand and they can see how kind of unjust and horrific it is for that person I think that's what will motivate more people to then take further action I think that's the thing is sort of you know we live in a world that is you know increasingly difficult to operate mm. in even just within like a the, the context of a cost of living crisis mm. right you're sort of like dipping around hustling here right, and everywhere yeah. uh, and particularly in a city like London it's very easy to just sort of be in your mm. in that little tailor bubble mm. and suddenly stopping and being like well hold on a second no like the mm. violence around you and like when you start to notice it it really i find it really hits it home but then yeah. when you connect and i think the same you know the those the spaces that you mm. mentioned you know i, I helped form lesbians gay support the migrants yeah. as well and like that was a really nourishing time for me and the, yeah. the connections we made with other groups and just having that 
community of people you can go to definitely and talk to about this violence and and not just sort of be like oh shit in it but mm. be like okay, what are we gonna do about it and yeah how are we gonna do stuff about it definitely so i wanted to end by kind of what people sitting here mm. can do yeah um I mean, it doesn't need to be like a five-point plan, but sort <laughs> yeah. of like, you know, what what is the major thing that would help you as someone that you know dedicates your life to mm. organizing within this space that mm. people can start doing um, to try and you know pull the needle, get rid of the hostile environment, yeah. this government, capitalism, borders, 100%. et al. I think um, there's loads people can do. I think obviously the kind of groups that we've mentioned today be really important if people are kind of have the energy and the time to commit to those spaces, to join those spaces and to organize with them. And organizing in those spaces can mean lots of different things. I think it's really important to acknowledge, as we've kind of touched on the, you know, going and locking yourself to each other outside a detention center or an airport comes with quite heavy criminal consequences um, at I times. That, yeah. yeah, it can. <laughs> um, and therefore it means that it might be less safe for kind of people from certain backgrounds, particularly racialized backgrounds, working class backgrounds, um, to put themselves in that position because they might be subject to even more police um, violence and brutality from the state, the criminal justice system. That's not to say that we don't do it as well, but it's something to kind of be conscious of. And obviously those actions are not always accessible as well if you have disabilities and you're not able to kind of lie on the floor for seven hours um, and, um, you know, then face 23 hours in custody. So I think um, it's really important to acknowledge that, but the kind of work that goes into organising a direct action or kind of community interventions, you know, Cop Watch did an intervention last night where they screened a documentary on Stoke Newton Police Station. Um, and so there's so much kind of work that can be done to sort of create these spaces, whether they're disruptive spaces or whether they're kind of educational spaces or whether they're kind of, you know, joyful resistance. Um, and I think kind of beyond that, there's also so much that we need kind of to support our campaigns, you know, JSWI runs loads of campaigns and, um, you know, they're always actions that people can take digitally. And we've seen how those work as well, you know, Freedom From Torture um, and groups like JSWI um, campaigned against Privilege Style uh, to kind of pressure them to not fly planes to Rwanda. And they've actually dropped out of that. You know, we, we, we found that out last week. And so that kind of campaigning that's targeted towards corporations like does work and that's something we need people to support too. I think also just understanding these issues and talking about them in a more nuanced way within our communities, within our workplaces is, is vital. Um, and so I think following some of those groups and organizing in some of those groups can kind of improve people's understandings of like the connections between these different struggles and bring people along with us um, and challenging like harmful narratives where we see them, whether they're in the movement or outside of it. Um, and I think that's why, you know, trade union organizing is also really important to kind of lend material solidarity with migrant communities. And that includes, you know, trade unions like IWGB that organize in the workplace, um, organize with delivery drivers in particular at the moment, all groups like London Renters Union who will also organise with um, precarious migrants who are facing kind of issues with their housing. So I think wherever you can lend your like skills and energy and do it in a way that's kind of, you know, empowering, but also safe, you know, within the confines of what you can do as an individual and how you can lend that to the collective. I think that's really what I'd love to see more people do at the moment. The biggest influence for me and my contribution to this book is my former supervisor, Bridget Anderson, who's written Arguments for No Borders for a while. But her book, Us and Them, The Dangerous Politics of Immigration Control, is for me the best take on the UK's immigration policies. And a lot of, a lot of those ideas get transposed and worked into, into our ideas, I think. There's a couple of fictional vignettes at the end of Against Borders. So maybe I'll suggest a couple of the fictional books that I really, really love um, that have kind of made me think about what other worlds might look like and how do we talk about the world we live in now. So Civil War Land in Bad Decline by George Saunders and Women on the Edge of Time by Marge Piercy. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much to you for joining us, whether you're watching or listening. Against Borders, A Case for Abolition is out now. Go and get it and join a union.